Hi, I'm Sophia Zabadaev. I'm an emergency ultrasound fellow at Loma Linda University Medical Center, and today I'll be talking to you about pediatric abdominal ultrasound. First of all, we'll talk about the objectives. So indications for various imaging, a quick overview of anatomy. We'll talk about different probe types and the technique for different studies. We'll start off with intussusception. So indications for this study would include abdominal pain, vomiting, a right upper quadrant mass, current jelly stools, and a child between ages three months to six years. We do see a peak incidence between 10 to 14 months of age, and about 65% of patients present under the age of one. It's a very common etiology of bowel obstruction in children, but it's relatively rare in adults and only accounts for about 1-3% to of cases of obstruction in, a, in adults. Uh, delayed diagnosis leads to increased bowel wall edema, ischemia, and bowel perforation, uh, making the need for surgical intervention more likely. But with our advanced modalities of imaging, mortality has been reduced to less than 1%. So a little bit of background, we see about 50 cases per 100,000 children per year. It is the most common cause of acute abdomen in children. As I briefly mentioned, it's also the most common cause of intestinal obstruction. Complications include bowel necrosis, and there is a short-term recurrence rate of about 5 to 10%. So if a child presents after having this diagnosis recently, you should still keep this in mind. Um, if they have any evidence of bowel necrosis, they definitely will need a surgeon involved. Otherwise, an aerobarium enema may be appropriate. In regards to the anatomy, we see um, most commonly iliocolic intussusception, where we see the small bowel kind of invaginating into the colon. Uh, that's the most common form, and we see that about more than 70% of the time. But we can also see enteroenteric and colocolic intussusception as well. Ultrasound is a wonderful modality for this. So the sensitivity is 97.9% and specificity is about the same, and it has a really high negative predictive value. For the probe, we'll choose the linear probe. Of course, if we have a much larger patient, you may need to use a curvilinear probe, but given that we're generally in imaging small children, the linear probe usually gives you the best resolution. In regards to technique, we'll set our depth to about six centimeters at minimum, and we're going to slowly sweep superolaterally until the liver and gallbladder is visualized, starting in the right lower abdomen and then we'll proceed along the course of the large bowel. And of course, as with everything in ultrasound, we want to image in two planes. The most common ultrasound findings are the target sign, also known as the multiple concentric ring sign that you can see on the left-hand side of the screen. We can see inflamed bands of hyperechoic mucosa um, through that image. We can, if we switch to our, our um, long axis view, we can also see what we call the pseudo kidney sign, uh, where a fat containing mesentery is dragged into the uh, into susception, which kind of repre uh, represents a kidney. If you've if you've done some imaging, you'll see the resemblance. So here's a quick image that I got from the POCUS Atlas, which shows. Uh, you know, the kind of the concentric ring sign there. And then our next image really highlights the pseudo kidney pretty well. This was actually in an older patient, not a pediatric patient, but it shows the image perfectly of what we expect to see. Next, we'll talk about Meckel's diverticulum. So indications for this kind of imaging include GI bleeding, abdominal pain, bowel obstruction, vomiting, and a child aged less than five years old. Uh, as we all learn in medical school, GI bleeding is kind of the highlight in this one where, where the children will present with painless um, rectal bleeding most commonly. It is the most common congenital defect of the GI tract. It affects up to 3% of the general population. Usually it's found in children less than two years old. 
um, and males are more likely to have complications from this. They do proceed with surgical resection if there is persistent bleeding. Um, of note, this is usually diagnosed by technetium scan, so this is not, um, ultrasound isn't really the modality of choice, but if you are picking up a probe and happen to find it, you know, this just may be an incidental finding. Um, and if you remember back to, to the anatomy uh, really quickly, they have a little outpouching the diverticula, which we'll, we'll talk about more in a second, but surgery um, usually involves resecting that diverticula and then anastomosing the adjacent small intestines. And this can usually be done laparoscopically. And then here is the anatomy. So the appendix we find right at, um, adjacent to the cecum and about a couple of feet proximal to that in the small bowel is where we usually find the Meckles diverticulum. Normally the vitelline duct, which connects the growing fetus with the yolk sac is absorbed into the fetus by the seventh week of pregnancy. But when it's not fully absor absorbed, um, a Meckles diverticulum can develop. It can contain cells from both the stomach and the pancreas, and the cells from the stomach can secrete acid, which causes the ulcers and the bleeding. Our probe type again will be the linear probe. We're using this because we're imaging small children and it's good resolution to get those images. On ultrasound, this is just a still image showing a cystic non-compressible tubular blind ending structure with thick irregular walls. And the walls uh, consist of layers of a normal bowel arising from the ilium usually. And this is another case from the POCUS Atlas. This was a two-year-old male with a history of constipation who presented with an episode of pain, uh, painless hematochesia that involved an hour prior to arrival. He had a benign abdominal exam, but POCUS revealed a, a focused fluid collection in the right lower quadrant uh, with a bowel wall appearance containing a hyperechoic focus. Um, which is suspic suspicious for a, a Meckles diverticulum with a fecalith. Next, we'll chat about appendicitis. So the patients that we'll be imaging will be those with right lower quadrant pain, fever, pelvic pain. They may have an elevated white count or have peritoneal signs. There are 250,000 cases annually with a lifetime prevalence of 9% in men and 7% in women. And the predominant age is usually 10 to 30 years old. Ultrasound is about 84% sensitive for detecting appendicitis, but it is very specific with a specificity of 96%. And it's always important to remember that failure to identify the appendix does not include it. Um, a lot of people, you know, depending where you work, will either have MRI or CT readily available um, for further imaging of this. And there are many places where the appendix can sit, which makes it a little bit tricky. Um, sometimes it could be retrocecal, uh, and then you can see all the other locations, postilial, preilial, pelvic, subcecal, um, and so sometimes it's a little bit tricky to track down. The probe type, again, will be the linear probe, but if you're imaging an older person or an adult, you may switch over to the curvilinear for a little more depth. And there's various techniques that people go by. Um, one option is to point to the uh, area of maximal tenderness, have the patient just point to where it hurts the most and then start scanning there. Um, the other option is a systematic approach where you can start in the in the right upper quadrant in the transverse orientation with the indicator facing to the patient's right and then you'll trace the ascending colon downwards until reaching the cecum um, and then you know move slightly more medial and then scan up and continue kind of like a lawnmower throughout the abdomen until you're able to find find the appendix there isn't really a right or wrong answer it's whatever you feel most comfortable with uh, findings on ultrasound, so there'll be non-compressibility of the appendix. It again will be a blind-ended pouch. 
The diameter of the appendix will be over six millimeters with a single wall thickness of over three millimeters. We look for the target sign on ultrasound and we may see a hyperechoic appendicolith with posterior shadowing. And so those are all kind of clues that the patient may have appendicitis. Here on the left hand side, we can see a dilated appendix with a diameter greater than six millimeters. And then on the right hand side, um, we're looking at a longitudinal view, seeing a blind ended pouch and a dilated appendix. And this is just a quick image of the appendicolith where we can see the posterior shadowing that we expect to see with a stone. This is a longitudinal image of the appendix. This was an 11 year old male who presented with one day of periumbilical pain that migrated to the right lower quadrant with associated nausea, vomiting, and anorexia. Um, here they're using a high frequency linear probe showing the enlarged appendix. It actually had an external diameter of 1.32 centimeters with trace free fluid posteriorly. And they also saw a fecalith at the proximal end of the appendix. And this was a, a nine year old male who presented with right lower quadrant pain. And here we're seeing the longitudinal view again with a dilated appendix. This is the same patient in a transverse view. Uh, we're able to see the, the vasculature on the left hand side and then the tubular structure here on the right hand side, um, which is the appendix. This is the same patient, a view of their pelvis, um, and it's always important to take a quick peek at the pelvis because you want to know if they have a ruptured appendicitis. And here we see free fluid in the pelvis, which is concerning for a ruptured appendix. Lastly, we'll quickly talk about mesenteric adenitis. So the patients that we're scanning will present with abdominal pain, fever, peritoneal signs, an elevated white count, and generally we're looking for something else. So we, you know, most patients that come in, we don't think, oh, they have mesenteric adenitis, let's go scan their abdomen. You know, we're, we're trying to rule out appendicitis or more insidious pathology, and then we kind of stumble across this diagnosis. For the background, there's about two to 16% of patients who present with symptoms of acute appendicitis who are also found to have mesenteric adenitis. Uh, about 20% of patients with appendicitis are, um, uh, are found to have mesenteric adenitis in addition to the appendicitis. And the average age of these patients presenting is about 25 years, which is in the same region as those with appendicitis. In regards to the anatomy, we have lymph nodes throughout the mesentery. Um, here we can see highlighted on the, on the left side of the screen where the lymph nodes are kind of in the right lower quadrant in close proximity to the appendix. Probe type, we will use the linear probe once again. Um, if you're having trouble viewing another structure, you know, you may have switched probes, but we usually will start with the linear. And for mesenteric adenitis, this is just a still image. Um, we generally will find the absence of a visibly enlarged appendix if they only have this, but we will find uh, the presence of enlarged mesenteric nodes. Uh, normal mesenteric lymph nodes are ovoid shape. Uh, they have a prominent fatty hilum and they have a short axis diameter, less than five millimeters. Uh, but here, you know, they're significantly larger than that. Generally, the enlarged lymph nodes are located anterior to the right psoas muscle in the majority of cases, or they can be in the small bowel mesentery. These are a couple of my references. Thank you to POCUS 101 and Dr. Din, um, the POCUS Atlas, and then Mon Matiers for the additional information. And thank you all so much for listening in today.